Ben, police say they were chasing a reckless driver who was driving in a stolen car. That chase ending right here. But that chase is just one of several that has started a conversation about vehicle pursuits. Yes, they did, Ben, and law enforcement officials are calling those people heroes today. If you just take a look at the aftermath behind me of that explosion, which left three people dead and one person still missing, well, Ben, they're over it. And quite frankly, if I was being honest, so am I. We're at Reed's Marine Boat Shop here in Delavan, where people would typically be out shopping for boats on a day like today. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Yes, Ben, throughout the entire playoff season, you can expect high five. You can expect additional security. Uh, so they advise people to come in early and uh, just to make sure that to check their bags. So travel light if you can. And those fans are having a great time out there. Sarah Tamer live for us tonight at Pfizer <laughs> Forum. Sarah, thank you. Like many areas here, seeing just grass is a sign that hopefully winter is over. Well, as we all know, that's not exactly the case. According to DHS, hospitalizations for flu-related symptoms are increasing by about 50 a day. Powerful and heavy are certainly two words to describe this day. City leaders and officials echoed the same message today, asking the community to rally behind our local law enforcement. A Syrian family who fled the war-torn country is starting a new chapter here in Milwaukee. They opened a new restaurant tonight on the city's south side. Sarah Tamer shares their story. Abdul Halim Obade and his wife Riham Silan moved to Milwaukee in 2017 after fleeing Syria's civil war. I love it, Milwaukee City so much and all of people here. When you walk through their new restaurant, Damascus Gate. You will enter from that gate. This is Damascus Gate, this gate, after this gate, you will find Damascus here. You'll get a taste of Syria, but the meals prepared in this kitchen include ingredients of hardship and struggle. I know that this is emotional for you. I can see your eyes, they get watery when you talk about Damascus, you know. Why do you think it makes you so emotional? My family. I asked Riham in Arabic why they opened this restaurant. Giving war-torn Syria a chance to be recognized differently. This restaurant uh, uh, is our dream. And Sarah is live outside the restaurant. Sarah, we can see people there in the restaurant. What kind of response have they received? Yeah, you know, they're just closing up behind me, a very successful event. They said people have been very kind and welcoming and helpful. And they tell me they're hoping to use their business sort of as a way to help people understand the conflict in Syria. It's bigger than a meal. Sarah Tamer reporting live in Milwaukee. Yes, that's right, you guys. And if you take a look, people are already lined up for that concert that starts at 7.30. Now, Stacey Krushke was actually here in 1999 when the Backstreet Boys played at the Bradley Center. 20 years later, she tells me she's still their biggest fan. In 1999, I believe that's when Larger Than Life came out. And I remember them singing, they had the perfect routine. Stacy Krushke was 12 years old when she attended her first Backstreet Boys concert in Milwaukee. And I remember screaming like such a little fangirl. 20 years later, at 32, not much has changed. Clearly. Not even the shirt she wore to that concert. Back in 99, when 12 News covered the craze back then. So these are homemade shirts that we had made specifically for the concert in 1999 and somehow I still fit into it. Krushke lives in Boston now but didn't miss her chance to fly back home for a concert. Backstreet Boys at home, nowhere else you'd rather be. Exactly, exactly. Although where she first saw the band is now reduced to rubble. It's a little sad, but I think for Milwaukee it's progress. A lot may have changed in the 20 years since, except for that 12-year-old girl. Krushke says she's still there. Oh, she's here. She is still a fangirl. She is definitely still here. 
How fun is that? So she's a big fan, Sarah. I imagine she's had this day marked on her calendar for a while then. Yeah, she's been planning for it. She tells me she bought her tickets, tickets six months ago, and she's here tonight with the same friend that she went to that show with 20 years ago. Oh, my goodness. Who she's got that? the same shirt and the same, same friend. Same friend, and they're going together. It's the perfect <laughs> night. Love it, Sarah. Thank you. Joining us live outside Pfizer for I did, Joyce. And this one right up here is actually going for $7,000 per night. One Milwaukee man I spoke to isn't charging guests quite that much, although he says he just might if the competition calls for it. Thousands of people are expected to attend Milwaukee's Democratic National Convention, and some may be spending thousands of dollars to stay at a nearby Airbnb. I think the DNC is going to really benefit a lot of homeowners. Uh, you know, just one night alone can practically pay your mortgage payment for a month. Ryan Alsop owns an Airbnb in downtown Milwaukee. He typically charges $400 a night, but during the DNC... Much higher than the DNC, which is... Good news for us. He's charging $1,500 a night, modest compared to others who have listings upwards of $7,000 to $10,000 per night the closer they are to Pfizer Forum. Do you feel tempted to do the same thing? Yeah, I definitely been tempted to uh, raise the price. It's not just Airbnb. One homeowner on another site, Verbo, is asking for $7,500. It's pretty crazy and high. Uh, we booked ours at 1500 I thought it was kind of reasonable within that mid-range where um, it's kind of fair for both parties. All about the supply and demand. Sarah, are there any of the Airbnbs here booked already for the DNC? Well, Joyce, Airbnb says more than 400 guests in Milwaukee have already booked rooms for DNC 2020. It'll be a busy time. Sarah Tamer reporting live in Milwaukee. 12 News Sarah Tamer is live at the medical examiner's office for us here tonight. Sarah, you've been talking with people on the front lines of the addiction crisis. I have been. I spoke to one Milwaukee man who knows all too well what it's like to deal with drug addiction. He's now hoping to help others. I went from dealing drugs and living that lifestyle to then using the drugs. Jonathan Martin says it's a miracle. He's still alive. I could lean on my own um, pride and say I beat the odds, but that's not true. The 38-year-old spent most of his life in gangs on the streets of Milwaukee and dealt with a serious drug addiction. Heroin, cocaine. But when he had a near-death experience after overdosing, he joined God Touch Milwaukee, an organization helping men in the city overcome addiction. He's now been sober for a little more than a year. Does it ever cross your mind that you could have been a statistic? Yes, yes, it does. Uh, I should have been. The statistics are a harsh reality in the city. Since Friday morning, there have been a total of 12 apparent overdose deaths in Milwaukee County. I read that headline and I was shocked. First responder David Mikek responds to overdose calls every day, but he says this weekend was one of the worst. When I started 10 years ago, it didn't seem like it was that big of a problem, whereas you're hearing about it more and more now in the news and we're seeing more and more of it on the streets. It breaks my heart. Martin hopes people seek help before more lives are lost and the opioid epidemic gets worse. You can fight this and you can win. You can overcome your addiction. You can break those chains that you are tied to this drug and tied to this lifestyle. You can be free of that. Such an important message there. Sarah, do first responders have any idea why the number of overdose deaths have been so high since Friday morning? Well, Ben, the medical examiner's office has scheduled autopsies for tomorrow morning, uh, but they tell me that it may be new drugs coming into the city that are stronger and more powerful. Toxicology reports will confirm. Sarah Tamer reporting live for us here tonight in Milwaukee. But as 12 News Sarah Tamer explains, this photographer is now the one stunned after he says 20 grand in equipment was stolen. I've never had this amount of stuff stolen from me all at once quite like this. It, it kind of felt like I got fired from a job. So I just like lost everything in one moment. Milwaukee photographer Samar Ghani was filming a band on tour in Chicago Thursday night. He says he briefly left his equipment in a locked car just outside the venue, not knowing it would be the last time he saw it. The window was just shattered and my bag was missing. $20,000 worth of equipment stolen. My brain like shut off. I was in entire like total shock. Like I didn't really know what to think or what to do. He called police, but he says the worst part about all of it is the moments captured in videos that are now gone. I was producing a tour video for the band every day and the, the last tour video was lost uh, that day. So it was like, 
like two or three gigs worth of video just just lost unfortunately. Ghani was in Chicago when his equipment was stolen, but it's here in Milwaukee where he's made a name for himself. He's scheduled to shoot Pride Fest and two weddings this weekend, forcing him to open up a credit card and buy new equipment. But for a man who sees through a lens for a living, Ghani says he's focusing on the bigger picture. If the universe is going to test me, I'm going to I'm going to fight back. In Milwaukee, Sarah Tamer, WISN 12 News. 12 News, Sarah Tamer was there for the big moment. And Sarah, this was a scavenger hunt proposal? Yes, it is, Joyce. Photographer Jim and I were here earlier when we spotted a woman and her friend talking into the camera, getting excited, filming themselves. Of course, we were curious. We asked them why. She told us she was on the hunt to find her soon-to-be fiancé. It is often said that life is an adventure. We started in Oak Creek. Then I went to the office of the volleyball club where we met. For 23-year-old Sam Abate, the adventure starts now. I'm just anxious to see him because every stop we get, I'm like, is he here? Is he here? Is he here? Because I just want to see him. She spent her day on a scavenger hunt proposal, going from place to place, each destination carrying a special memory. Aww. And now we're at Bradford Beach where I met his sister this summer. Friends and family followed along the journey virtually. Oh my God. <laughs> Hi. And photographer Jim and I followed her every step. This is yeah. a lot of effort. This is a lot of effort. I've done a lot of driving. It's been great. <laughs> Bringing her closer to the final stop at Bayview Park, where her soon-to-be fiancé, Alec, was standing before he got down on one knee. It's so freaking pretty! It was like a spur of the moment, like, all right, this is a great idea. Let's get rolling on it. And then I just worked hard for it. I was just more excited to see him when I realized his car was here. And then, like, walking up... Um, on the beach. And so as the sun sets, a new adventure begins for two people eager to spend a lifetime together. That is awesome. It looks like The Bachelor could take some cues from those two. <laughs> Sarah, how many different <laughs> locations were involved in the scavenger hunt? Joyce, there were seven total location, and Alec tells me it really only took him a few days to put all of it together, so pretty impressive, if I have to say. <laughs> Wonderful, and no wedding date just yet. All right, thank you so much, Sarah Tamer. Well, Patrick and Joyce, Milwaukee officer Trevor DeBoer was inside the courtroom today as the jury reached a verdict. He says today is a day of closure for the entire police department. It's a, a big relief for Matt's family. Uh, for all his brothers and sisters that he works with. This verdict doesn't bring Rittner back, but do you feel like justice has been served? Uh, Matt's looking down. I think he's happy with the, uh, the outcome of today. Trevor DeBoer was with Matthew Rittner February 6th when they were serving a search warrant at a Milwaukee duplex. He was just inches away when Rittner was shot and killed. This is probably the worst part of this job. A jury found Rittner's killer, Jordan Fricky, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide Friday. Fricky faces life in prison. He told the court he believed he was being robbed and fired the fatal shots in self-defense. The jury rejected that idea, and so does DeBoer. He knew, you know, what we were doing, um, who it was when we entered. DeBoer says it could have been him and that Rittner saved his life. Did you ever consider taking off your uniform? and quitting your job after that happened? Absolutely not. I'd do it all over again. Um, I might, you know, switch some spots and change some positioning if I could uh, forecast something like this, but I would do it all over again. And uh, I'd work with the same people, uh, and I'd have Matt standing right next to me. Sarah, we did not hear from Officer Rittner's wife today. Did he say what her reaction was to the verdict? Yeah, Officer DeBoer says she, along with the entire family, are satisfied with the decision reached today. Sarah Tamer reporting live at Milwaukee Police Headquarters. We just got on scene about a couple minutes ago, actually. I'm joined now by Sergeant Schmidt, who tells me they do have a man in custody. But if you can just kind of tell us what happened. I know you guys have been on scene for about two hours now. Yes, we have. Uh, we were sent about 3 o'clock for a male who was just distraught in the parking lot with a weapon. 
Uh, at this point, he'd only threatened himself. He was outside the hospital in the parking lot. Uh, the hospital went to lockdown. Everybody was safe. He didn't have access to the building. We negotiated with him for about two hours, and he just surrendered the weapon. He's in custody now. Did he give you guys any reason why he was doing what he was? I don't know that yet. Uh, I know that he'll get a mental health treatment or assessment. Uh, but beyond that, I really don't have a lot of information yet. It's still evolving. I know I asked you this earlier, has the hospital been evacuated at all? They have not been evacuated. They were on lockdown. Uh, that'll be lifted shortly. Uh, so nobody was allowed in or out. Uh, and that way it keeps everybody safe from there. He didn't have access inside the building. He was outside the doors. They were able to lock those doors along with the doors behind that. So there's really no threat inside of the hospital. Uh, and we were able to set up a perimeter pretty qu quickly outside uh, to limit the dangerousness of it to the community. And when are you guys expecting the lockdown to end? Uh, in the next couple of minutes, I imagine. All right. Thank you very much. Absolutely. I appreciate your time. Um, now, we did also get a statement from the hospital that I want to read to you guys. The hospital says uh, they are protecting the safety and the well-being of their patients and team members. It is their top priority. They are working with authorities who are on scene managing the situation. As you just heard, they do have a man in custody. He was outside in the parking lot for a couple of hours with a gun. We spoke to neighbors out here who were concerned, uh, but that's all the information that we have right now. I'll get back to you guys as soon as we know more. All right. That man surrendered to police. He did, Ben, and the scene actually just cleared within the last 20 minutes. Police were here behind me for the last two hours after they received a call for a man who was distraught in the parking lot. Now, they say the man had a gun and was threatening to hurt himself. They say it's unclear why he came to the hospital, but he never made it inside. The hospital went to lockdown. Everybody was safe. He didn't have access to the building. We negotiated with him for about two hours, and he just surrendered the weapon. He's in custody now. Now, the man is getting a mental health evaluation. The hospital said they are working closely with authorities and that the safety of their patients is their top priority. Toya, Ben. Sarah, thank you. They do, Derek. And it all happened right here in this parking lot right behind me. Neighbors across the street say they saw the whole thing unfold. All units on the air advise no more patients to Memorial until further notice. No patients to Memorial ER until further notice. Video shows a man with a gun pointed at himself sitting outside of Sheboygan Memorial Hospital. We advise we're going to be delayed here for a little bit discussing transport options. Police say he was threatening himself. They say it was unclear why he came to the hospital, but he never made it inside. The hospital went to lockdown. Everybody was safe. He didn't have access to the building. We negotiated with him for about two hours, and he just surrendered the weapon. He's in custody now. First time I've ever had to not be able to get into the hospital entrance. Parents were screaming at their kids, get in the car. No, we got to go this way. Like, it was just chaos. What was your reaction when you saw a gun in his hand? I guess it was kind of crazy just seeing this happen. You know, you hear about it on the news, but you never see it happen around here. Neighbors who live across the street say they're happy no one was hurt, but can't help and think about the worst case scenario. I was actually standing here praying. I'm like, please just keep everybody safe, the law enforcement and the SWAT team, and because it could have turned out really bad. Sarah is back with us live tonight. Sarah, has hospital officials said anything? Well, Derek, the hospital has sent us a statement earlier that said the man is now getting a mental health evaluation. They say they're working closely with authorities as uh, the safety of the patients here is their top priority. Sarah Tamer reporting live in Sheboygan tonight. Two-year-old Nolani Robinson has been missing since Monday. Tonight, family and friends are pleading for the public's help to help bring Nolani back home. With 12 News, Sarah Tamer and Sarah, escaping is a real struggle. Yes, it is, Derek. I met with a local human trafficking advocate who tells me, like many other women who have been sex trafficked, she risked her life when she chose to walk away. You start thinking about all the young ladies that you work with, or even yourself, that that could have happened to you, that could have happened to your child. Nancy Arbro is all too familiar with sex trafficking. You don't choose a life, it chooses you. She was trafficked for nearly four years. It's not as easy to turn away from something when a person believes they own you. When Yarbrough made the decision to leave, she knew she was taking a risk that could end up taking her life. To tell them no, when you, you promised that it would always be yes, is the most difficult thing to do. Did you ever fear for your life after you left that lifestyle? I feared that if I went back with him, what he would do, but I also feared what would I do without him. Yarbrough is now dedicating her life to raising awareness through her program, Fresh Start. She wants to help women who have also run away from trafficking. It's a hard pill to swallow. That's why advocacy and awareness is so important.
And Sarah, we know in the case of Sierra Robinson and Darius Higgins, he had ties to multiple states across the country, and that's why police said it was so hard to track him in this case. How common is that with suspected traffickers? And Derek, it's very common. Nancy tells me they call them hotel surfers because they don't stay in one location for a long period of time, and they typically have multiple addresses, which makes it hard to track them down. All right, Sarah Tamer reporting for us tonight. Thank you, Sarah. New here at 10 o'clock. Yes, it is, Patrick. This area here on 36th and National is very popular for those who frequent food trucks. So when they heard those food trucks were in jeopardy, they decided to step in. Yes, Patrick, that meeting will still happen, but Mayor Tom Barrett says he will be very surprised if council members try to overturn his veto. Sarah Tamer reporting live 